Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. The Bible makes it very clear God keeps covenant with his people. This speaks about God's faithfulness to his promises, and that should give each of us great comfort to know without any doubt that God will do what he says. He will keep all of his promises. Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 14. The book of Isaiah, chapter 14. In today's installment, we're going to look at the first 15 verses. And we're going to continue next week the rest of the chapter. And we're going to see in this chapter, there is a clear reference to Satan. And that gives us insight for a few reasons. One of which is that we need to see this in a larger picture. God is speaking here, and make no mistake about it, about Satan's defeat. And that tells us that there's implications too the last days. In fact, when you read carefully this first part of Isaiah 14, there are several references to the last days, meaning this. We ought not simply understand this prophecy as relating to Isaiah's days or in the near future. But this scripture has end time implications. And I believe that that is undeniable. Now, one thing I would encourage you to do is even before you listen to this video, simply to pause it and begin to study for yourself. Looking at these first 15 verses in a variety of translations. And I'm going to tell you, the more translations you look at, the more confused you're going to be. Because there's several places here where when we just look at the verse, we can't be sure on who is the emphasis of this passage. But when you allow parallelism and also as you read on, it becomes clear whom God is speaking to. The problem is that many translations, they just, in my opinion, guess at it. And therefore, you have some having God as the pronoun, and sometimes we have the king of Babylon. And Babylon is a very important term in the scripture. For example, in the book of Revelation, we see that there's a judgment of Babylon. And most scholars agree that we're not talking about literally Babylon. But Babylon is being used to give us information concerning this final empire, the empire of the Antichrist, which is connected to Satan. The word Babel, where the English Babylon comes from, is a word of confusion. Now, when we look at the book of Genesis, for example, we know that there's the Tower of Babel. And this is where humanity wanted to exalt themselves up into the heavens. And they made that great tower. But what did God do? God frustrated their work. He defeated their plans and he brought to them confusion. Now learn a principle. Whenever I serve self, Whenever my objective is myself, my desires, my purposes, 
that is going to bring about spiritual confusion in my life. It's just that simple. Always, always, and always. It is only when I set aside, when I nail to the cross my purposes, my desires, and I choose His purposes, I submit to His will, then that's going to bring a spiritual clarity to my perspective. I'm going to see things differently. So even though there is indeed a judgment on Babylon, this is what we learn from Isaiah. Isaiah frequently gives us an end-time prophecy, but yet we see within that, he talks about something that is going to take place sooner in the time of Isaiah or shortly thereafter. And when you see that event take place, when it happens, then you can be assured that the end time promise is equally reliable. In the same way that God was correct, he was right in what happened in the near future. We can be assured that God is 100% accurate about what he says concerning the last days. So Isaiah 14, when we look at many of the commentators, we see that there is great disagreement among them. You can't just simply read one or listen to one individual and such and come away with clarity. It's going to bring confusion. But when you approach the scripture, this chapter, relying upon right methodology, proper means to exegete, to bring out the meaning of the text. When you do that, you're going to be amazed with how clear the prophecy is. But we don't have to take one another's words. We can dive into the text. We can look at the grammatical indicators. We can see the liter literary devices that are employed here and utilize them for a right understanding. So let's begin. The book of Isaiah, chapter 11, beginning with verse, chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning with verse 1. We read, Ki Yerachem Hashem et Yaakov, which means the Lord, and this is that yud hey vav hey, that, that transcendent name of God. So the Lord, for he will be merciful with Yaakov. So we see here that God is affirming he has inspired Isaiah to give us insight that God plans on being merciful in the future. Now, someone might argue in the future for Isaiah's time. Maybe it's later on in his life. Maybe it's shortly after his death. Maybe it's at the time of Messiah's birth. All of those are legitimate uh, hypotheses. But the scripture is going to be clearer in a moment. So once more, the Lord, for he will be merciful with Jacob, and he will choose Od. Now that word Od means either more or again. And in this case, it is again. So it's because the mercy of the Lord that God is going to choose again Israel. Now, this is important because we see some indicators. When we look at this first verse of chapter 14, we see that it's poetic. There's parallelism, and that's obvious to see. We look that merciful, that he will be merciful, is parallel with God choosing, with the Lord choosing. He's merciful to Jacob, and Jacob is parallel to Israel. So we see God's choice is not rooted in Israel's merit, in some place that Israel can demand 
God to be merciful or God to choose Israel once more. It's all based in God in a covenantal commitment. So once more, look at verse 1 of chapter 14. For the Lord, he will be merciful with Jacob, and he will choose again Israel. And what is God going to do? Well, it says here, Ve henicham al admatab. He will set them upon their land. So right here we find something. It is not Israel's merit. It is not because they deserve to be brought back or set or positioned in that land again. It is because of his mercy. It is because of God's selection that he is going to set them. And who's them? Well, Israel and Jacob, this people, the sons of Jacob, this nation of Israel. It is going to once more be placed in their land. And it's very important that we see that. Al Admatam. Admatam, their land. And Nilva Hager Aleha. What this means is that there's going to be the proselyte. This is one who's not of the household of Jacob, and it says that he is going to join. Now, this is the same word where we get the word Levite from. It's escorting. So what we find here, as God sets Israel back in the land, there is going to be the, the sojourner, the proselyte, the Gentile, who is going to be escorting them, in their restoration to the land. And then we see, Venispehu al Bet Yaakov, and they will be annexed upon the house of Israel. Now, this word I translated annex, when this is being recorded, there's hopefully in one week from when this is recorded, probably around the time that you're viewing it the issue of the sipuach. What's sipuach? Well, it's in every Hebrew newspaper and it's in every news report. Sipuach is the Hebrew word for annex annexation, annexing. Right now, there's much talk about the nation of Israel annexing Judea and Samaria, about 30% of that area, bringing it under the sovereignty of the modern nation of Israel. My own personal hope is that all 100% of Judea and Samaria would be annexed to the modern nation of Israel. But it's very interesting here that this word comes up and it simply says, and they are going to be annexed concerning the house of, of Jacob. So we see here as God is merciful, to the Jewish people, there's also going to be an outcome for the Gentiles. And that shouldn't surprise us because that is how God consistently, that is what his covenant reveals. So all of this reveals to us that God's faithful to his covenantal promises. Look now to verse 2. Now, the subject here is the word amim. Amim is peoples. In this case, we're talking about Gentile peoples or nations. So we have, and people will take them and bring them. Who's the them? The children of Israel, the sons of Jacob. And we know that in a moment because of this parallelism because of what Hebrew poetry, the laws, tell us. But look at verse 2. People will take them and bring them to, once more, their place. Now, this is the second time that the Word of God has told us that this land is their land, their place. This is all because of a covenantal commitment by God. 
And then we had the subject, because of parallelism, we had the subject, Bet Yisrael, the house of Israel. What will the house of Israel do? Well, it says the house of Israel is going to settle them. Now, this is the same word for the modern Hebrew word for a settler. It's in a different form. Settler would be a noun. This is a verb. So the house of Israel is going to settle these uh, peoples, these nations, these proselytes. They are going to settle them upon Admat Hashem, on the land or ground that belongs to the Lord. Now, why the change? Early on, we saw their land, their place. Now it's the Lord's place. This is to teach the student that God is free. It's his land originally, but he, through covenant, has given it to the sons of Jacob, the house of Israel. But this is not eliminating the blessings that come to the Gentiles. But make no mistake, it is only when Israel gets back to the land that we're going to see that there's going to be Gentiles also escorting, coming with, and being part of this worship experience. God's going to bring it about, his original purpose. He's not going to change it. There's not another plan that God's going to go to. It's this plan. And we find here that they are going to settle them, that is, the house of Israel is going to settle them, these Gentiles, for servants and for maidservants, meaning that these Gentiles are going to recognize God's call, God's purpose, God's plan with Israel and support that. Now, this has nothing to do with the church because this is a passage. When's that going to happen? Well, this talks about the events that are going to lead up and bring ourselves into the millennial kingdom. And what will the church be doing? Ruling and reigning with Messiah. It is a false teaching to believe that during the millennial kingdom, believers are in heaven. Not at all. When Messiah returns the second time, believers, and the scripture I go to so frequently, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says clearly there that when Messiah comes, so too will the saints be with him. So realize that in a very clear way, that, that God is going to return through Messiah Yeshua to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords in this millennial kingdom. He's going to rule, and we're going to rule with him there in the millennial kingdom, not in heaven. Messiah is the king of the millennial kingdom, and where he is, the promise that we receive from Messiah himself in the book of John, chapter 14, is where he is, so will we be forever. So we're not in heaven while he's down here in, in the millennial kingdom. We're ruling and reigning with him. And then it says, and they shall be captors for their captives. We're seeing a change. So the ones, the nations who took Israel captive, Israel is going to take captive the nations, but not to exploit them like the nations did the Jewish people. But, but quite the contrary. And they are going to rule over, and the next word is no sehem. Nogus is the same word we find in the book of Exodus for these uh, barbaric and cruel taskmasters. So it says here that they are going to rule over those who were their taskmasters. They're going to not repay evil with evil, but they're going to execute a godly righteousness, a justice within that kingdom. So when we look here in the first two verses, we see that there is reference to a future, an end time, even a kingdom, a kingdom context for it. Now let's move on to verse 3. 
and it shall come about on the day that the Lord sets you. Now, what he's doing here, it's the same word for position, placing. So when God does that, notice what it says. For you, there's not going to be, you're not going to be any longer uh, afflicted. Now, the word here, we know the word in modern Hebrew, matzben, means to be annoyed or bothered. And the word, uh, zecha, which means to be made angry. Or it can also be a word for fear, to be caused to tremble. And what God's saying here is that when he does this, there's coming a change. No longer in that day, that's a kingdom experience, no longer are you going to be bothered, nor are you going to be made angry or you're going to tremble from the hard work which basically you were enslaved to, that you were forced to do, that you were made to work. So again, a change. It speaks of a change that is redemptive. When we talk about avodah kasha, hard work, and the words that are used here, they are reminiscent to the book of Exodus. And the change that happened in the book of Exodus is redemption. Coming out of bondage, that land of Egypt. And Egypt is synonymous with the world. So Israel's coming out of the world ways and they're going to rule over a kingdom, a new reality. That's what this verse is speaking about. And he says, look now to verse 4. Basically, on that day when you experience these things, he says, and you will lift up a mashal. A mashal is a proverb. A proverb is a short statement of wisdom a short statement that reveals important truth principles to to live by so he says when this all happens you will lift up a proverb this proverb concerning the king of babylon now the question is this is he talking about literally the king of babylon nebuchadnezzar or the one who was ruling when that Babylonian empire came to, to no more. And my, from the context, I would say no. Once more, we know elsewhere in Isaiah. We saw a, a hint of this last week. That Babylon is going to be judged, judged in the near future, meaning when, when God, after those 70 years of captivity, God judges Babylon. He does so through Persia. And that Babylonian empire was no more. It was absorbed into the, the rule of the Medes and the Persians. They took over this empire and expanded it. So we're not talking about this in this chapter. But when that happens, it confirms the reality of this. Notice what it says. Keep reading very carefully. Look now at, at verse, verse 4 once more. He says, And you shall lift up this proverb concerning the king of Babylon, and you shall say how the taskmaster ceased, and how, and the word here is the word madheva, how Madheva also ceased, stop. It's the same word when we look at it. It's the same word for Shabbat. Shabbat means to stop, to cease. That there is a stopping that brings about a change, a godly change that brings intimacy from God to his people. And we can understand what it means that the no guess, this taskmaster is going to cease but the word mad heva, if you, you do a good study of this word, and you have to dig deep. Now, sometimes people think a good study means simply going to strong concordance, being on some software, some program, and just clicking and it comes up. The problem is Strong's frequently gets their understanding from 
primary translations of the Bible. But when you do a good study of this, you find that this word means it has to do with one who is full of pride and one who delights in the suffering of another. So it's pride and causing pain. Pride brings upon a person they think their self-will, what they want. And what does this word speak about? One who wants others to suffer pain. And God is going to bring an end to this when he judges who? The king of Babylon. And when you speak of the king of Babylon in a last day's context from the book of Revelation, and I believe that, that John in the book of Revelation borrowed heavily from here in order to Show us what's going to happen to the Antichrist, that, that last empire, which is not a Babylonian empire. If you study the book of Revelation, you'll see that. But that's for another time. Let's move on to verse 5. Now, how is this going to be changed? What's going to bring it about? Look at verse 5. The Lord will break the staff of the wicked ones. Notice here, it's plural. We were talking about the king of Babylon, but in this verse, there's a plurality, meaning all these nations under this, this unrighteous king. And I believe that we're speaking about a reference to the Antichrist. So the Lord will break the staff, that rod of the wicked, and the staff of Moshlim, those are rulers. Those are, it's the modern Hebrew word for like a governor, one who has authority. But in this context, one who misappropriates that authority, who as well loves to bring that suffering upon another. So God's going to break this. Look now to verse 6. When we go to verse 6, we find that there is a, a strike and we have to ask ourselves, who is doing the striking? And we don't find the answer immediately. We have to go forward and look closely to what is being said here. So sometimes it is uncertain, but as we read more, it becomes clarified for us. Look at verse 6. The strike of the people with wrath. Now, is this the people striking with wrath? No, it is not. It is God striking the people with wrath, and this would be his wrath. It is a, a blow that is not removed. And this means that there is some eternal implications to this judgment, to this wrath of God. So it's going to be a striking that does not remove. He is going to rule them, same word that we saw earlier on for ruling, with, with anger. He is going to rule with anger the, the nations. And we find that they are going to be, to be persecuted without uh, restraint, without withdrawing from. So when we look here at this verse, we see an eternal quality of Punishment that's not taken away. Punishment that does not end. Punishment that is without any type of change. And only God can do that. Now look at verse 7. How do we know this is God and not uh, uh, someone else? Because notice the outcome. You see, verse 6 tells us that there's this striking coming of wrath. It's not the wrath of the people, the nations, but it's the wrath of God. And after God's wrath falls, with his, which is in correlation to his judgment, notice the outcome. Verse 7, and therefore quietness. This is the idea of tranquility will rest over all the, the earth. And they will break forth, burst forth with rina. Rina is the word for a shout 
a shout of joy, a shout of excitement that comes from a perceived victory. And the reason why I say that, this is the same word that the children of Israel shouted concerning the ark. Now, they perceived it to be victorious when the ark came in, but because of their disobedience, it was not. But normally this word has to do with a victory, a foreshadowing of victory. Look at verse 8. Now, verse 8 is very important. If we don't understand verse 8, it's going to, to cause us to misunderstand the rest of what we're going to study this evening. Because we're going to look at verses 8 through 15. We'll do it very quickly. And we're going to see that it's when you read these next section, these next several verses, that you can arrive at the proper understanding. Now, here again, my advice to you is to look at how some of the translations render this. And many get it wrong. Verse 8, also cypress, and these would be cypress trees, will rejoice of you. Now, it's rejoicing. They're rejoicing concerning this one. It's in the second person singular. Now, they're rejoicing because of this one. It says they rejoice of you. And it has to do with what's going to happen to this one. You'll see it clearer in a moment. Verse 8 once more. Also, cypress trees, they will rejoice of you. And the cedars of Lebanon, since you have been brought down, laid down, there has not gone up the one who chops down, chops us, that cuts us anymore. So we see here that because this one, this second person, second person singular, you, because of what happened to him, this is a reference to the king of Babylon, which I would say is related to, in this context, that final empire of the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is a type of Satan incarnate. And where we're going here, without any shadow of a doubt, is to speaking about Satan. It is because his Antichrist is defeated that he's going to be defeated. And it's because of the true Christ victory, Messiah's victory, that, that God is going to be praised, that God's will is going to be completed, and Satan's will is going to be thwarted. So look again, verse 8. Also, cypress trees will rejoice concerning you, and the cedars of Lebanon, they're also rejoicing ever since you were made to lie down. And no longer will go up the, the cut, the one who cuts us. Verse 9. Sheol, this is the place of the dead. Sheol, underneath, they uh, uh, shake concerning you to, to meet your coming. So we're talking about those in dead. They also tremble. Now, why is this? And this is a word for fear. Those in Sheol, they're upset because they were loyal to who? They were loyal to Satan. And now we're finding the one that they put their trust in. What's going to happen to him? Well, notice, they, underneath in Sheol, they tremble concerning you to meet or approach you when you come. And the Raphaim, this is the modern Hebrew word for ghost, but it speaks about, in its original context, those uh, uh, souls that are outside the body. They rise up concerning you. And all the goats, these would be the rulers of the earth who got their power from Satan. It says, they who had raised their seats, uh, their thrones, all the kings of the earth. Now, what are they upset about? Well, look at the next verse. All of them answered, they say concerning you, 
also you have been made, and the word here is for sick, but it has to do with a, a term of being, being put in an adverse condition. Also you, like us, have been made sick. And it says, unto us you are likened. So it's speaking to one, and is it the king of Babylon? Well, when we read further on, we find that it turns into Satan himself. And that's why this king of Babylon in the future, this, this Antichrist, and the empire, and all the nations that sided with him, they are upset. They tremble because the one that they put their trust in, their hope in, is now treated adversely and is meeting the same fate as they are. Verse 11 it says, Brought down Sheol, your, your prideful one. So this one who is full of pride, he was brought down to Sheol, and your, your string instruments, this is a word for harps in the plural. It says, your harps, they hum, and in the places down below, your down below place, it spreads out with what? The maggot. And, and covers you, the worm. So it's a place of decay. What's happening is this. It speaks about Satan being bound in, in hell. It's this imagery of his defeat and how those who are already in hell are going to be so remorseful because their leader was defeated and met the same fate that they have. Now verse 12. How you have fallen from the heavens. And then we have the word Hallel ben Shachar. Now Hallel, I don't know why some Bibles will translate this as Lucifer but it's the word Hallel, and Hallel is the Hebrew word for praise. And that's what Satan, Satan is, a created being. He was given an assignment to praise God, to lead the praise of God first in the morning. The word Ben Shachar means of the morning. A, a son of the morning means literally of the morning. You were supposed to be the one who brought to God first praise unto him. But this one, he says, how you have fallen from the heavens, Hallel ben Shachar. You have been cut down to the earth. You are the one who have weakened all the nations. Now, this has to do with the term Gentile, but we need to understand it in the right meaning. It speaks to those who have no covenantal relationship with God. They rejected a covenantal relationship with him through Messiah, and this is why they are in Sheol. This is why they are in the place of torment, of, of hell, because they made a terrible decision. They believed this liar. And we're speaking about Satan. Look now to verse 13. Here's his mindset. And you have said in your heart. Now again, it's always you, you, you. And the you here is Satan. And we see the relationship between Satan and this king of Babylon in the same way that there's a relationship between the Antichrist and Satan. Verse 13. And you have said in your heart, the heavens I will go up above the stars of God, meaning I'm going to be higher than any of the angels. He says, I am going to lift up my throne and I will set. Notice what he says. I will set in the mountain of the Moed. What's Moed? This is the place where, where the children of Israel would come and worship God on the festivals, the Moedim. So at the mountain of Moed, the festival mountain, speaking of Jerusalem, it says here that he wanted to be the one that they came up to and worshiped in Jerusalem. And this is a reference to the abomination of desolation. That's what, what the Antichrist is going to do. 
He is going to demand worship when he enters into the holy place. So he says, you have said in your heart, to the heavens I will ascend above the stars of God, meaning above all the other angels. I will lift up my throne and I will sit in the mountain of the appointed time. And then he says, Be yecharte tzaphon. And this is a reference when we talk about the, the north side. Rashi points out that there is a phrase very similar. Simply another word is added in Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 11. So you can check this out in an interlinear and you can see the connection. It is a reference to the altar. And what it's saying here is that he wanted all sacrifices to go to him. He positioned himself in Jerusalem to be the one who is sacrificed to. He wanted that worship, but he's not going to be successful. Verse 14, he says, I will lift up upon the, the, the clouds and I will be likened to El Yon, which is the most high God. That's his problem. He did not want to praise God, thank God, serve God. He wanted to be God. And therefore, verse 15, our last verse, but to Sheol you will be brought down, made to go down. To, and it's a play on words, the same, same reference to the place of sacrifice where he wanted offerings made to him. He says, you are going to be brought down to the place of the pit. And that's where you're going to be. So Satan is not going to have success. Now that shouldn't surprise us, but here's what I want to close with. Do you see undeniably Satan's defeat, his being bound in the abyss, which we see in Revelation 20? And when we look here, we see in the chapters leading up to Revelation 20, especially chapter 18, we see how Babylon has fallen. It's announced several other times before chapter 18, but Babylon has fallen. What is Babylon? Babylon is that empire that was opposed to the purposes of God. And instead of wanting redemption, they wanted exile. They wanted to hinder the things of God, and that's exactly what Satan does. That's what the Antichrist is about. He stands opposed to the plans of God. And that's why it's so important that we see how the scripture begins. For God to bring an end to the enemy, the end to the work of Satan, it's not going to happen until God chooses again Israel, Jacob, the Jewish people, and bring them back to their land. I mean, I don't know how one can read this with integrity, allowing all the, the, the nuances and the hints of the text to speak to us and come up with another interpretation. God is wonderful because he is faithful to his covenantal promises. And over and over and over in the scripture, we see prophetically that God reminds us of just that fact that he's a faithful God to his word. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <laughs>